Hello everyone and welcome back to Whiskey Wednesday. Today, tiny rant, been doing a few of them recently. Uh, but first, the whiskey. Today I want to chat to you about Ben Romack, 15 year old, if it will choose to focus, which it has. Um, a whiskey that launched in 2015, uh, aged exclusively in first fill barrels, some bourbon, some sherry, 43% natural colour, Filtration method unknown, uh, and launched in 2015, peated to about 12 to 14 ppm, so a nice gently peated Speyside style. Um, got big love for the 10 year old, I think it's great for the money. Um, reviewed the Cara Gold release a couple of months back, really interesting whiskey, very fun. Um, also reviewed that with John Drinks a while ago on John's channel, in the whiskey shop. Uh, and now I've got a bottle of the 15. I bought it a while ago. It's had like a nice chunk taken out of it. Um, weirdly enough, I've found I've been pouring this while I've been cooking. Um, and it's really sort of helped me with uh, some of the notes this whiskey has. But yes, it is a beautiful natural colour. And I just think it's one of the most lovely whiskies I've come across. It's one of the only whiskies I've ever had which smells and tastes like whiskey like what you would imagine a whiskey to taste like. There's heat, there's spice, there's gentle fruit notes, there's smokiness, but um, let's tuck in, see what's going on. The nose straight away is a wonderful combination of classic Speyside and West Coast influence kind of fusing around. The lovely kind of green apple note sweet toffee, a little bit of caramel, merging with this kind of salt, pepper, pepper in particular. I think the official tasting notes for this do mention like cracked pepper, yeah, cracked pepper, charred oak, apple, chocolate, and forest fruits. The pepper thing's really important. Ben Romack 10 is, Ben Romack as a whole, not just the 10 or this one. Peppery whiskies, that kind of floral, freshly crushed black pepper that has that kind of lemony scent to it really backs up that, again, caramel, apple feel. I'm smelling dark chocolate and forest fruits now because of what I've read on the back of that box, but there is like a tempered kind of snap dark chocolate smell to this. I don't know too much about the forest fruit thing, what is really classed as a forest fruit these days, like blackberries or stuff like that. I'm not really getting a lot of that. Comes across a little bit more exotic to me. Um, there is some first fill bourbon in here, and you do get a little bit of that mango, pineapple. It's sitting quite far back. The upfront thing is the pepper and the the apple, and then weaving around throughout all of it, it's just this tiny bit of like ashy, salty smoke. A wonderful nose, just very inviting. And it's one of the whiskies where I smell it and I kind of go, ooh. You know, it's a space side, but it's doing something a bit different, which is what got all of us onto Craig Ellicky back in the day. I think it was 2015 or 2016, Craig Ellicky launched their official whiskies. Very similar to this. Uh, slightly higher strength, but I'll chat about that later. Let's taste for now. Oof, okay, a lot going on there. Um, let's talk about texture first of all. It's a 43% whiskey and we don't know if it's chill filtered or not. If it is, it's got one of the most amazing oily mouthfeels I've ever come across. And if it isn't chill filtered, then that makes sense because it's got a very oily mouthfeel. Do bear in mind there are degrees to chill filtration. It's not the be all and end all. Um, and indeed, how what degree you choose to filter at does have a different effect on the whiskey. If you want more detail of that, go back to my Highland Park Twisted Tattoo video. 
because I think they were the only distillery I've ever seen which stated what degree it was actually chill filtered at. Um, never seen a company do that before or since, so maybe more people should do that. But a wonderfully oily mouthfeel. The chocolate thing's coming through a lot more on the finish. That's because I can taste that right now. Again, that kind of snapped, brittle, dark, kind of coffee-like dark chocolate. The palette is wonderful. It's just this apple-y, green, fresh. Again, more caramel. These kind of like juicy green fruits, things more like white grape and pear. Really, like not zesty, but like just ripe and juicy. And then as you kind of move it around your palate, smoke and spice and pepper and salt all kind of move around. They don't really stay together as a flavor. Um, you know, like a coastal West Coast Scottish flavor. They're kind of separating and doing different things to you. So sometimes the pepper mixes with the apple, sometimes the salt comes with the smoke, sometimes the salt comes with the apple. The caramel thing gets a bit smoky and salty too. If you're a fan of oaky whiskies, I'm not a huge fan of oaky whiskies, but this sits within the balance of oak. As you begin to swallow it, all of the fruit flavors go away and the oak kind of sits there, literally like a stave to pull them all through. And after you've swallowed it, the chocolate thing is there, but you're also getting oak, really dry wood. Peat steps out in a big way. And even though it's only 12 to 14 ppm, it is trying to dip its toe into that thing Lefroy does. Not medicinal, not in any way medicinal, but that drying element that Lefroy smoke has in particular, and Ardbeg too, um, and Kalila, most of the Islas, but uh, most of the Isla whiskies. But I always associate that with Lefroy, and what comes with that is always like a dryness, but like a creaminess of like hazelnut and chocolate. And I get that with this. Wonderful whiskey, it's coat in the glass, like, splendidly. If I can move my head out of the way and try and get a bit of a focus on that. There we go. Those big beads just kind of coat in the glass. Fun whiskey. Um, one of the reasons I bought this and wanted to talk about it is because it isn't 46% alcohol. Now, I've been wrecking my brain through um, my YouTube comments, other whiskey reviewers' YouTube comments, <clears throat> and I apologise if this is a bit ranty, but I think it's a conversation that's worth having. And that conversation is that just because a whisky isn't 46% and unchill filters, that does not automatically make it good. A lot of you are Deanston fans. I don't really get it. I'm not really a Deanston guy. And I'm falling away from Bunner Harbin too. Not just because of pricing, um, but I keep retrying Deanston. And I'm a bourbon fan too, and they really, they use bourbon casks really well in most of their stuff, and I just don't get it. Um, so that's my first point. Just because something is unchill filtered and 46% or higher, automatically does not make it good. That applies to a host of single cask whiskies I've tried over the years um, that are 46%, 50% cask strength, unchill filtered. Doesn't make them good. It's nice that it's there, and that is the sword I do have to fall on. It is nice that it is there, and you can experience whiskey at a higher ABV. But when it comes to the company which owns Ben Romack, that company is Gordon and McPhail. And I know they rebranded stuff a couple of years ago and it upset a few people and the price increase that came with it, but it's just the way whiskey's going, especially single cast whiskies. Um, but I feel that Gordon McPhail know well enough that this tastes good at 43%. 46% would take it into a different tax bracket in terms of UK tax. So that could be a reason why they've not bottled it there. But do you not think they've tried it at 43 and gone, still really good. I know their cash strength bottling gets a lot of review, really good reviews. I've had loads of Ben Romex cash strength releases. I remember the whole, the old 100 proof. It was delicious. But this is still very, 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 very good whiskey at 43% alcohol. And I have a slight theory. I mean, this thing was released in 2004. 
15, I think. So, seven years ago. And I feel like if they wanted to change it to 46%, they probably would have by now. Because they're Gordon and McPhail. And they have... Every single cast bottler claims to have the largest stock of everything. But I feel like Gordon McPhail have been around long enough to literally, and probably have the largest cachets of Scottish whiskey in the world. Who aren't a distillery, but do own one. And the way things are going at the minute, especially from a retail perspective, and from looking at secondary markets and being in whiskey forums, if something is released that is good value, until filtered and 46%, it's not around for long enough. It just disappears. And the same thing happened when Ralphie gave um, their cash strength release, I think it was a 2012 vintage. As soon as he said that was good, it sold out everywhere because he said it was good. This is still great whiskey. And if you've never tried it before, I recommend you do. Probably start with a 10, do an online tasting or something like that. But if this was at 46% and was truly unchill filtered, would it last on shelves? Because Springbank is pretty much unattainable. Glen Allerkey is going that way. Trying to order 12 and 15 at the minute isn't as easy as it used to be. Um, people are falling away from Glendronach for for obvious reasons, but I think the whiskey still tastes quite good. Um, although the price on it is rising. Ben Riac, most of their whiskies are 46% and unchill filtered, but because it's not a in-demand small brand, they're all still there on the shelves. Whereas if they put this at 46%, I think they'd sell out too quickly and they'd move through stock too quickly. Maybe I'm just on a little bit of a, a whiskey conspiracy theory here, but I think what's, what maintains this brand's integrity more enough is that you can always attain it and it's not silly money, certainly not compared to other 15 year olds that are on the market. And it does the job of tasting a bit like everything really well, just like Springbank. But the more we say it's just like Springbank, the more it will probably disappear quicker. That sentence was very bad. It will disappear quicker. That's a personal theory. Very long video, do apologize. But anyway, I really like this whiskey. I'm gonna give it a solid nine out of 10. I think it's good value. I think it tastes great. It's a solid age statement. It's most things that most whiskey drinkers want. But I'm gonna give Ben Romack 15 a nine. I think it's absolutely outstanding. And awards don't mean everything, certainly not in the modern world, but I think it is the only whiskey to obtain a platinum award from the IWSC, I think. I think it's won best category gold medal six times. And I think it's the only whiskey to ever do that. I don't really believe in awards, not the big sort of shiny ones anyway, because they don't really mean anything, but it is the only whiskey to attain that, which is something to say about it. But yes, what are your thoughts below? As I say, this is just a theory of mine from a whiskey drinker's perspective, from a retailer's perspective, and just looking at things that are happening with any brand which releases anything at 46% and relatively affordable, it just goes. Does that say something about the wider market of whiskies which aren't 46% and, and are chill filtered? Or does it say something about whiskey collectors and how they are hoarding good stock to have for the future? And there's nothing wrong with that. I've done that with a few bottles, maybe bought two, maybe three of something to see me through my, uh, my later years with. But is, is that in itself a problem by buying four or five after seeing them available? on an online confirmation or something. Just a chat, it's an open space. But um, yes, thank you all for watching. I'll see you next week. Cheers.